Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations. I'm your host, Furkan Dandia. If any of the material in this episode resonates with you, or if you're looking for coaching services, I would love to hear from you. You can find me on Instagram at you know is then, or email me directly, lifecoaching at you know is then dot com. In this week's episode, I'm really excited to welcome Chat Zuek, who is the founder of A New Kind of Man. In this episode, Chat shares his own journey and what allowed him to build a new kind of man. Chad and I also discuss the four principles of his work and break down each one. Chad also shares his study of masculinity and how he believes every man has the potential to become a good man. Chad is also the host of the podcast, Men of Iron. Please check out Chad's website, theanewman.com or find him on Instagram at a new kind of man. And as always, if you could leave a five-star review at the end of the episode, I would truly appreciate it. Hey, Chad, welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining today. And, you know, again, just wanted to express my gratitude for you taking the time and and the opportunity to come on here and and have this conversation with me today. and then before we get started, I, I just want to give you an opportunity to, to introduce yourself, talk about what kind of work you're doing um, and, and where you're located as well for the listeners. So, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, it's good to be on the show today for Khan. I am actually based out of Dublin, Georgia, small town, rural Georgia. That's where I live, lived here for the last 11 years and uh, happily married, been married a long time, got two two kids, uh, grandbaby on the way, got an 18-year-old daughter, she's in college, 25-year-old son who is out doing his own thing and uh, just living life. So yeah, I've actually been doing uh, work with men for approximately 20 years, and I started a movement for men called A New Kind of Man, and just started with the Facebook page, or well, Facebook and Instagram page that morphed into a podcast. Uh, and called New Kind of Man. I did that for a while. Now I'm podcasting with a a movement of men called Men of Iron, and I've paused my own podcast, and now just kind of doing that, just don't have time to do all that. Mm -hmm. But been uh, in the men's space for a while, just helping men, whether individually or in groups or now through podcasting and uh, any influence that I have, you know, I'm grateful for and grateful for conversations like this. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, Thanks for sharing that. And, And I guess... Uh, trying to understand um, like the work you're doing, uh, maybe if you could share what got you into it, uh, what inspired you to work with men. I mean, 20 years is a long time uh, for someone like me. I, I just started in this space uh, a year ago. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, you know, I'm also looking to, to kind of learn from you today. So yeah, what got you into this space? Rad, great question. Um, you know, for me, I would say what got me in this space was uh, brokenness and father wounds, uh, wounds in my past, not really knowing why I was doing the things that I was doing. And until uh, ultimately for me, you know, God started to show me what it was about me uh, that was broken and who I'd, be, who I'd blamed for all those years mm-hmm. and realized the more that I blamed other people, I was just holding my own life you know, in, in check, I wasn't growing, I wasn't able to move on. So through that process of my growth, you know, it was immediate thing. It was, it's really cool. And I've seen this over and over and over through the years. It's when somebody is healed, oftentimes they themselves want to be a healer. So, uh, and I don't necessarily think that I'm, you know, of that ilk and, you know, that I'm the healer. I think ultimately my, my belief is that God is the healer, but he's used me to be able to help a lot of men and kind of steer them in the right direction as much as, as they'll listen, as much as, you know, as I have to share at the time. But really the reason why I got involved, it wasn't because it was cool and flashy. It was because I was broken. And, uh, and as some things in my life started to come back together, uh, you know, just as things, just even little fundamental things about what it means to be a man. As soon as I started to come together, I started getting in groups and wanting to invest in other guys. And, and I've for, been fortunate through the years that several guys have wanted to listen and uh, mm-hmm. and also just be sounding boards for my bad ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's uh, it's 
funny you mentioned that and 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 um like i think it, that applies to a lot of men right and myself included where and you're right it's maybe not so much about healing others but it's potentially guiding them and, and sharing yeah. uh the journey that we've been on mm -hmm. so others can benefit from it or you know and and also building a community of men where mm -hmm. they can all come together and and help each other out um you know when i look at myself i still don't feel like i've completely healed because there's still going to be issues that are going to keep coming up and that's where i think as men if we have that community of support we can we can uh, fall back on each other in, in that sense um but like in in the work you're doing one of the things that really jumped out to me was kind of like and I don't know if you describe them as four pillars, but that's what I, I think your foundation is based on for, for a new kind of man. Do you want to share some of that and, and maybe share what inspired um, like building your foundation on those uh, pillars? Yeah, great. I'd love to. You know, it's really interesting. If, if you were to look to my left, you'd see just a bunch of books uh, about men and marriage and all sorts of things, different psychological books, and you'd go through all these. And, and I tell you all that not to, not to like put on airs like I have some you know, great library, but I'm a reader. It's mm -hmm. actually part of the four pillars, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. But so if you were to look to my left, you'd see all these books. And one of the things that I had, I had an opportunity at a, one of the schools here a couple of years ago, they just asked me to kind of like teach this seminar, if you will, on what it means to be a man. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I, I looked at all this and kind of the plethora of information that these authors had, which are great, you know, it's just really dialed in stuff. But there was really nothing that I really wanted to say. There's nothing in that that I was, I just wanted to regurgitate somebody's new material. I mm -hmm. just felt like there was something in me that had to birth something new. And I felt, to be honest with you, I felt very kind of insecure in that because I was like, what do I have new to add? Because I have all these books over here, people a lot smarter than me, been doing, you know, deeper work than I yeah. have. And, and yet, you know, one of the things that, that kind of jumped out was just a passage in the Bible. And it was, it was so simple. And sometimes things are so simple that they think that simple means easy, but simple is not easy. But yet it jumped out. It was so simple. And it, it's a passage of scripture in Luke 2.52, and it's talking about Jesus particularly and talking about his life. And it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and in favor with man. And for me, you know, I'm, I'm not the brightest guy in the world, but, you know, after looking at that, I was like, there's something there. Like there's, there's something foundational. I do call them pillars, actually. Mm -hmm. And I look at them like there's something foundational. There's some pillars there if I just lean into it. So uh, just break those four things down and we can go deeper into each one of those if you'd like to but yeah absolutely jesus grew in wisdom so i i extrapolate that down to wisdom to me is learned experience i can learn from your experience you can learn from my experience we can learn from experience of others um or you know some things have happened in in our you know in our past but so that's where i draw the intellectual piece that jesus grew in wisdom so there's mm -hmm. an intellectual piece there but not just intellectual as far as i'm going to read books and i'm going to get smart and inflate my ego but mm -hmm. yet i want to actually read things from people who are deeper and different subjects maybe that's that's even fun or just generally interesting or something's going to make me a better man and mm -hmm. i want to get deep in that knowledge and i want to apply that knowledge so that's the intellectual pillar so jesus grew in wisdom that's that he grew in stature. So that's where I look at physical strength. I'm, I'm someone who's always been physically active, at mm -hmm. least I say always. Um, I'm in the best shape now that I've probably ever been, but including my time in the Navy. But I, I got serious about my fitness um, when I was about 35. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, probably 11, 12 years ago. It's when I really got serious. I started running and started, I've, I've kind of dabbled, but got more serious in it. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of like always gravitated towards that, at least, you know, from a glancing standpoint. But when I look at that scripture, Jesus grew in stature. Well, that's physical strength. He, he took care of himself. You know, yep. he wasn't just running around flippantly. He, you know, he was living a very active life. Uh, you know, if you just look at what he did, he was very seldom ever sitting. He was walking from city to city and, and you know, around the Sea of Galilee, like making laps, it seems like. So. Yep. Um, you know, physical strength. So Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God. So there's a spiritual pillar there. Yeah. That's the most obvious one. So there's going to be a spiritual pillar. 
And one of the things that I've found about my own life is the closer that I've gotten with God, the more he's shown me about myself. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's just that gravitational pull, uh, uh, for me is, is the, the more I, I do things to put myself in alignment mm-hmm. with knowing him and who he is, the more he has shown me who I am Yeah, and, and then brought in some of that healing. Right. So there's the intellectual piece. There's a physical piece. There's uh, the physical piece. And the last one is that Jesus grew in favor with man. So that's where I got the relational pillar. Then looking at all the relationships that we have they're, they're to help us grow. You know, mm-hmm. every, every single person, whether it's this conversation or somebody who I can actually sit around a table and have a cup of coffee with, or somebody I can sit around to grill with and have a beer, or it's my wife or my kids or, or just my extended family or, or even just my neighbor, you know, there's a relational piece there. And, and those people are in my life to show me something and to allow me to become the man that God wants me to be. So uh, it's just kind of an outpouring of things. And for me, that's that was a huge task bringing that to bear because I felt so insignificant in the grand mm-hmm. scheme of things. So what I really started to understand is perfection, which is my tendency, my negative draw is is toward perfectionism, and I know mm-hmm. that about me. Mm-hmm. But so for me, it's like it's putting aside perfection. I'm never going to be perfect in any of those things ever. Mm-hmm. So I'm seeking mastery, and and so for me, I kind of like weave my story in and out of this. Uh, doing the the deep work, the self work, whatever you want to call it, yeah. um, to pursue mastery over my own domain. That way, I can actually be a man of integrity over those four pillars. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's what I long for of being a man of integrity. Integrity is rooted in the word integral, which is drawn from the word whole. So, I want to be whole in those areas or pursue that. Yeah, yeah, and and everything you said resonates for me, and I guess. I just want to kind of dive into each pillar, if you may. Um, like when I, when, when you were explaining wisdom, that for me really, w- w- what resonates for me is being humble, right? Yeah. Uh, almost like always reminding ourselves that we will never have all the answers. Mm-hmm. We can always learn something from some anyone. You know, I have an eight-year-old <laughs> and he often ha- brings these learning moments for me in my life. You know, uh, you'll often mirror things for me. So, uh, and I'm just sharing that because even for an eight-year-old, I can learn something from him, right? So, so it's, to me, that wisdom really translates to having that humility, uh, which I feel like every man should have. And I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but. Yeah, to me, humility is, is base level of everything. You know, if, if a man is in humble or trying to grow in humility, you can't teach him anything. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was that guy. I was that guy for a long time. You couldn't teach me anything. I thought I had it all figured out. What I, and then once I got to the point where I, I began humbling myself, I started to realize, wow, I was just, quite frankly, I was just a, a, a boy in, in a man's body, you know, like mm-hmm. in, internally, I just was. And just kind of like rife with fear and everything else. When you talked about humility, I was reminded of a quote uh, from an ancient author by the name of Andrew Murray. And he says, humility is the virtue of which every other virtue hangs. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's just such a picture of truth. You know, it's just humility. If, if you are a, a gaining and trying to grow in humility, I mean, you can learn anything from anybody, including your eight-year-old son. Like you said, I mean, just to, just to turn on that growth mindset. You know, and I think it's as much a growth mindset as it, as it is a growth heart set. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, no, for sure. And then kind of moving on to the, the, the physical aspect of it, as you described, to me, that really means that as men, we need to be disciplined, right? Whether yeah. you're, you're physically active, you're running, uh, but you're taking care of yourself, right? And, mm-hmm. and uh, being mindful of, of what you do with your body and your mind. Uh, for that matter. And, and I think that's where, uh, you know, discipline is so important. And we see how when men struggle with that aspect, everything else kind of falls around them. Uh, But I don't know what your thoughts are with that. Yeah, the one of the one of the best things that I did was create a morning routine Mm -hmm. built around these pillars, and, and, and to kind of slow down and to adapt uh, all of these things really before my day even takes off, where I, I just start in the morning, you talk about discipline. And I, I know that, you know, some of the guys who's going to be listening, who are going to be listening to this are like, yeah, I just don't have the discipline. The thing is, you can have the discipline and you may have the discipline, but what you may not have is the willpower. That's, mm-hmm. that's really what it comes down to. 
And there's a lot of different ways to get to get willpower. And one of the ways to get willpower is by exerting willpower. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's like a trap. Yeah, but it's true. Uh, so one of the things for me, I tend to be a, a, a kind of like rigid, dis- rigid and disciplined person. So if I'm honest, that comes a little bit easier as far as like my morning rhythm. So in, in the morning time for me, the best thing I can do is get up and I drink eight ounces of water before I do anything else. And then I may do some meditation or I may do some prayer. I may do some reading during that time. And then every morning outside of really one morning, because there's only I, I offer I give myself one rest day a week. I work out primarily in the morning before I go to work. So I go to the gym or like tomorrow morning, I'll be outside running at 6 a.m. And doing all that, I feel great when I actually get into the office. I feel like I've won the day, mm-hmm. but, but I can't do that without a, a base of discipline. I would offer this to, to some guys who are listening, and they're like, yeah, I'm just not that disciplined. You sound really gung-ho. You sound very, very military. That's not who I always have been. That's who I've become because I've chosen to be that way. Mm-hmm. And you as a man can do the same thing. So I would say this, just start small. Pick one thing that you want to do. You may look at that and say, oh, yeah, I want to meditate. Yes, I want to pray. Yes, I want to read. Yes, I want to work out. Yes, I want to drink water. I want to hydrate in the morning. Yes, I want to. I'm like, good grief. Right now, just set your alarm to whatever time you want to get up and start with that one discipline, and then you're going to see you have time to do everything else. Don't try and just automatically do everything, because if you try to do everything, you're going to do nothing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's just yeah. the law of willpower it's just going to collapse so i'm just i'm trying to avoid some heartache and some and some grief for the guys so uh, start small and you win the day yeah no and i appreciate you saying that because uh that's kind of what i tell people too is you know you you almost want to everything you have to start with baby steps right and, and when you set your goals uh too far apart and and you know if they're not realistic and not easy to achieve you're almost going to be discouraged by the immediate failure yeah. or, or you're just not going to build that momentum you're looking for. So I kind of agree with you in that sense that you need to start small and, and start working your way up. Yeah. Um, and, and I agree, like willpower is important. And I almost put discipline and willpower hand in hand because you can't have one without the other in my mind. Um, but yeah. Uh, and then kind of moving on to the third piece uh, around you know, and I know you mentioned God and, and spirituality, but for people that, you know, believe in a higher power and maybe not necessarily God, like, I think that really is connecting to, to something beyond yourself, right? Whether it is meditating or, um, uh, you know, using mindfulness in, in your daily practice, I think you can achieve that spirituality um, but what are your thoughts when it comes to that stuff? Because, you know, I know a lot of people don't necessarily see it the same way when it comes to, to religion or, or believing in something beyond themselves, right? Yeah. I mean, it's really base level for me. So that's, it's kind of a hard line that I have. And, you know, mm-hmm. what, people, what people do in their beliefs or their beliefs, yeah. it is a hard line for me because I've seen so much victory from it. Mm -hmm. And when I look at particularly, and again, I'm not trying to convince you or anyone else. I'm just just sharing my story. When I look at the four biographies of Jesus and I look at the, at the man that he was, there's, there's an incredibly compelling vision for manhood just by looking at Jesus's life and how he interacted with people. So for me, I'm really compelled to his life and what that means. And then what, what's on offer because of that. I do think that there's a, there is just an important element to you know you mentioned higher power and i think some of it is is just relinquishing control for some people like for instance i was flying a couple of weeks ago and i happened to sit right next to a guy who has been uh, he's actually been in sobriety from drugs and alcohol for 38 years and we just had a just a stunning conversation it was amazing he was just so so wise and so humble and so eager to talk about his story and and he and he he talked about, you know, he used the vernacular that you hear in AA. He, he turned out to be actually a Christian, but I didn't know that at, mm-hmm. for 50 minutes of the flight, right? So he just told me all the vernacular of AA and, and giving things up to a higher power. And what really dawned on me, and the reason why I share it with, with your audience today is, it's just this idea that you're not in control. Like, ultimately, like, that's a freeing thought that we're, we, what we can control is so minuscule in the scheme of life. Mm-hmm. And yet, when we realize that we're not in control of everything, but yet we do have agency over some things, 
it frees us then to have the emotional, relational, intellectual, spiritual bandwidth to actually do the things that we can do mm-hmm. without feeling like we have the weight of the world in our shoulders, which is why that I believe that's not I'm not an expert in AA, but uh, which is why I think it's one of the main tenets, because those people, they're they're essentially relinquishing control and realizing that there has to be for them. They have to come to the rationale that there's a power greater than themselves that's operating that if, if just left to themselves, that they're powerless over that situation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and I think what it boils down to is often the, you know, we talk about situations that are going to happen to us. Uh, how we choose to respond is, is ultimately our choice, but everything else is not in our control. Uh, how other people treat us or react, that is not in our control. How we choose to react, that is, you know, mm-hmm pretty much in our control other than that nothing else is um so so when you're working with men like how do you try to like uh help them build on that i just i take them from where they are you know you can't really treat every guy in the same way uh i've had the opportunity you know whether it's it's at a deep level where somebody just has some like long long lasting scars and wounds that haven't been healed and you know for them I, I really do it in this way. And these words aren't, aren't new. They, they're not my words, but they're words that, that I apply in these situations. So I think every guy, when you're working with them, whether it's a coaching or it's, you know, it's a group setting or uh, whatever, the, whatever the setting is, I think every guy needs uh, a level of what I call uh, invitation and challenge. Here's what I mean. They need an invitation that there's – there, that you're walking with them for one, that they're not going to be left alone because no guy, no guy ultimately wants to be left alone. They, mm-hmm. We may act like we want to be alone, but we actually are afraid of being alone. Yeah. Like that's just, that's just how we're wired. So there's a, there's an invitation to say, Hey, we're going to join. I want to join you in this journey. It's your journey. It's a shared journey, but it's your journey. And I want to join you in that. So I'm inviting you into, into a new vision and a new way to live. A new way to live, new way to love, new way to see yourself, a new way to carry yourself, mm-hmm. wherever it is that their base level. But yet there has to be, I think, even more of challenge. Because at the end of the day, we are we are to be initiating. We are the ones supposed to be leading. We're the ones supposed to be taking the charge. That's that's how we're wired as men. So if I don't I'm not the uh I'm not the, you know, pat him on the back guy, you know, the, the coach who's never got a firm word for somebody. I'm more on the other side. So I like, I invite them to something and then I also challenge them to become the person that they want to be. So I help them to create a vision for what they want to, you know, the purpose that they have, whatever it is that they want to achieve, whether it's something in their marriage, whether it's something in physical fitness, whether it's, it's just to be more, uh, just emotionally aware of themselves. So I help them, you know, it's a shared vision. I help them paint that vision from their life. And then I help them have goals to pursue that vision. Right, right. And, and it's important that you mention that challenge. And, and often we, we, a lot of people get scared or have that fear of being challenged because they don't know uh, what they're going to find out about themselves. Or it's that fear of just the unknown. Um, but it's important that you highlight that because I think without challenging ourselves, we will never step into that uh, outside of our comfort zone, I guess, mm-hmm. and, and really understand that whatever we're fearing is not as bad as we think. Right. And that's why it's so important that the, the invitation piece is there. Because if I just gave challenge, 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 yeah. which is my default setting, because, I'm, because I tend to be disciplined, I tend to be that. If I just do that, I'm just going to be a jerk. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And if, if I just invite them, invite them, invite them with no challenge, then they're then they're just going to be super passive and they're not going to be a man. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm just going to I'm just going to basically allow them to just stay where they are and not be the man that they can become. So it takes both of those things going together. And it's 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 going back and forth. It isn't like even doses. It's what's required at the time, because every guy's different. Every every story is different. Every background's different. And so there may be a guy who's who's just you know, who, who's just more physically along. I'm like, well, I'm not wasting time on that. You've got that dialed in. Yeah. Usually when guys come to me and, and they want any sort of mentoring or coaching, something like that, it's they already know what they're after and they're asking me to help them get to that place. Usually mm-hmm. it isn't vague. Usually it's very specific. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think it, I mean, internally, we all kind of know the areas we need to focus on. And often, most of us are lost. And, and we just need, you know, that guidance to get back on that path. Um, um, and then kind of moving on to the last pillar of relational stuff. And, and, and you mentioned, you know, relationship with your spouse or your children or your parents or your friends. I think that is so important. And as men, we don't really, like in my personal opinion, we don't really spend time understanding how we're showing up in our relationships. Yeah. And, and obviously you need to start at a, at a baseline, but ultimately, you know, uh, my role as a father is different than my role as a child, my parents, but we really don't spend that time to understand. Um, and ultimately it is important, you know, especially even connecting with our fellow man uh, and sitting in a circle or, or having a community of men, that also doesn't get enough attention. Um, and I'm glad you have that. And we, you know, I, I want to get into it a little bit more, but what are your thoughts in terms of what do we need to do as men to improve our relationships? Well, I don't think any, any man can grow alone. Mm -hmm. So I think ultimately there's, there's different things here that I'll address. I think that it's, it's good for a man to commit to a woman. I just do and, mm -hmm. and get in a committed relationship because when a man is in a committed relationship, he feels the weight of that responsibility and us as men were, we were made to carry weight, the weight of leadership and the weight of, of servant leadership, particularly. So, so for me, I think that the man has to carry weight. I think he has, that he should be. And I know that there's single guys who may listen to this, be like, I'm, you know, are you saying I need to get married? You know, honestly, I think that you are going to become a better man if you do get married, but don't get married because of me. Right. Sure. Like I, I just, I just can't imagine my life if I were single because what I what I was and not I'm not projecting this on mm -hmm. anyone else in your audience what I was was selfish. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I learned in relationships whether it's with my wife, my kids, my friends, my band of brothers, you know, whoever I'm around, the thing that I realize more and more and more about myself is I can be incredibly selfish. The answer to more, to to my selfishness is not more self the answer to my selfishness is look for opportunities to be selfless, mm -hmm. to do things relationally where I can't get anything in return, where, I'm, where I don't just do something to get something. You know, I don't love my wife just because she's going to love me back. You know, I don't, I don't hold my wife's hand just so later on that, you know, we can make something happen in the bedroom. I mm -hmm. like, that's petty. You mm -hmm. know, that's, that's not a good quality relationship of just like, you know, tit for tat, I give for you so I can get something in return. Mm -hmm. It's the, the best relationships are the ones where you can find yourself wrapped up in them to where you're not operating under this false self, to use a psychological term from Carl mm -hmm. Jung. Instead, you're to a place of selflessness where you're mm -hmm. just like you're just wrapped up in the, in the relationship. You're wrapped up in the conversation. And, and it's just almost seems like you get into a flow state, like when you get in those things because you're outside of the ego. Right. Yeah. It just it just gets easy. Now conflict's not easy, but but I'm talking about <laughs> there's times when it when things are rock and roll and it just feels easy. And yeah. that's the same thing if it was my wife, if it was one of my friends, a band of brothers, or my kids, or or whoever, a conversation like this, you know. Uh, we're not arguing yet. So we're st we're still rocking and rolling. We're doing yeah. well. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so that to me, uh, I think a man needs to be in a committed relationship with a woman. I just do. I think that they there's that polarity of the, of the two genders that I think reveals something in a man that needs to be awakened. And when it's awakened, he will find uh, just a, a deep sense of purpose in his life. Now, if a guy doesn't get married, I'm going really down the, <laughs> this rabbit hole. If a guy doesn't get married, I think he has to go out and he has to seek people who, who are not going to have sex with him, but, but seek ladies, women around him, you know, whether it's, it's a, a you know, whatever, a niece, a grandma, a mom, someone, a, a coworker, somebody who's not, he's not looking to get anything from them, but yet he can add that masculine strength and, and just kind of lean in with, with how uh, he is made. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a really important piece about masculinity is you have to have that polarity of femininity to, to balance us out. You know, uh, yeah. I can tell you for me, uh, again, my wife and I've been married for a long time, uh, but I, I'm just, I would not be the man that I am without her in my life. I'm not saying she's perfect. She's not, and I'm not perfect. And mm -hmm. that's the point. 
Yeah, yeah. And I, I just want to build on the on that partnership aspect a little bit. And I think, you know, and, and you know, if I were to infer, you're not seeing just go get married. I think no. there's a lot of work that needs to happen yes. internally before you can go into a partnership. Yeah. And that's one of the areas I'd like to kind of expand on a little bit because mm -hmm. men often feel like, hey, I'm going to get married and I want to be catered to and, you know, mm -hmm. I'll just sit there with my feet up, watch football or whatever. But I think as a man, you also need to show up, uh, whether it's it, it's your, your re uh, romantic relationship or any relationship. But for that mm -hmm. matter, uh, as men, we still need to do the work on ourselves. Um, and, and to your point, a partnership really allows us to grow. Uh, we grow as a as a, uh, a a couple, or or you know, and that's where the partnership grows. But we also grow individually. We do our own work individually, um, and we show up as our best selves. Mm -hmm. And and you know, you touched on it a little bit. There there should be no condition set there that if she does something, or you know, right. then I'm going to give her that. And that's where I feel like often things fall apart. And, and a lot of men run from marriages or commitment because they're worried about that, but they're not really holding themselves accountable or, or doing the work that is required. Um, so I don't know what your thoughts are on that. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a sad thing. I, I agree with what you're saying. It's kind of a sad thing uh, with a lot of guys that have actually been hurt by women or rejected by women or beaten by their mom or an aunt or someone, or they just didn't have a dad in the picture. So they tend to be a little bit gender confused. I'm not talking about, you know, you know, being trans or anything. I'm not talking about those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that even, even as a man, they don't know how to show up as a man because they've mm -hmm. never had that masculinity, you know, revealed to them and as an example in their life. So I feel for a lot of guys in that regard, because, you know, the common thread is, you know, my, my mom or, you know, my mom or my grandma is my hero. I, my wife and I were just watching a football game. We love, uh, American football. And so, you know, we're watching the football game and, and it was just kind of shocking. The uh, one of the players, I don't remember his name, but he, you know, they basically did like a little cameo spot about him and talked about how he has such a great relationship with his mom. And it just like it just got on my nerves. Not the fact that he loves his mom. I think that's amazing. Love your mom. But I, it, what got on my nerves, I told my wife, I said, you know what you don't see? The dads. Mm. Why is it? Why isn't it that there's very few dads in the stands, and yet it's grandma and mom in the stands, with with all these athletes? That and again, I'm glad that you know we came back to. I'm glad that they had someone showing them the way, and who knows what to the extent that that mother grandmother had to do mm -hmm. for that young man to be in that situation. Kudos to them. All that to say, men teach other men how to become men. Mm -hmm. Women cannot teach men how to become men. You, you cannot convince me otherwise. They just can't. It's, it, they're gonna, everything's going to be laced with the femininity because that's the way they're wired. And again, it's, it's, it, they're not wrong in that. That's just who they are. And that's mm -hmm. cool. Um, so I do think that that is, that is important. And I think one of the pieces that, that I said earlier and you jumped on too is it has to be a committed relationship. Committed was the key. Because if a man's going to show up, you know, in, and for him, if he's got a lot of baggage with with women in his background and he just doesn't know how to show up, man, it's just going to – fear is going to be the driver, and mm -hmm. he's going to want to bolt. Mm -hmm. He's either going to want to bolt to either not show up and not do the things that he ought to as a man, or he's just going to just bolt and leave that woman and kids is what we see an epidemic in, in our country right now in, in the United States. And also, you know, you see those types of dynamics – and yet what it does, it perpetuates another cycle to where there's another boy who doesn't become a man. Or they can only become a man after they've been wounded so deeply that it takes them a lot more years of healing for them to actually get themselves right. Yeah. So I love, to, I love to speak into teenagers when I have the opportunity to. I love to instill any wisdom that I have to the younger uh, boys trying to become men or learning how to become men. Again, not that I have the answers because I don't. I'm a student, right? Yeah. <laughs> I do a little teaching, but I'm a student. Yeah. You know, don't get me wrong. We're all students. Right. Yeah. But I love speaking into young people because if I could help them avoid some of the, of the pain and hardship that I've had, I think that that, you know, that adds to a life well lived. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess part of that, um, you know, and, and unfortunately a lot of men, 
don't have that male role model in their lives uh, when they're growing up. But I think it's important. The, the other aspect of relationships I wanted to touch on was, uh, you know, you call it your band of brothers. But I think just having that community of men, you can actually support each other. And that's an area that I've been focusing on, on a lot lately because I've, I see it everywhere. I see it in my community of friends as well, where, you know, we just don't have that male connection. We don't sit down and just uh, even have conversations with each other where we could be supporting each other. And I think uh, I read a book recently, it's called Circle of Men. And what he touches on is, you know, even to be better partners to our spouses, we almost need that community of men that we can go and learn from and grow with and come home and be better partners. Um, and, and uh, you know, again, just wanted to get your thoughts on that. And, and is that something, you know, your, the, the group work you do facilitates as well? Yeah, I think a band of brothers, that model, whether you call it a band of brothers, a brotherhood, you know, whatever you call it, I think is vital. Um, again, a man doesn't become good at being a man alone. He needs other men speaking into him. And uh, so for me, that's just really what manhood is. It's men speaking to other men. I think some of the misnomers that go with that is with guys, they're like, does that mean we just like sit around and we stare in each other's eyes and, you know, hold hands and talk about our feelings? Please no. Like that's yeah. not what that means. Yeah. No dude is going to, no self-respecting man is going to be like, sign me up for that. That's what I want. So it's going to feel different. Women make it easy, right? It comes naturally for them. They can sit across from the table and, you know, two seconds later, they're both, ball both bawling and they're telling their deepest, darkest secrets. For a dude, honestly, it may take six months and it may just leak out in a conversation. You're watching a football game. It's halftime. You know, you're, you're drinking a beer. And then all of a sudden he just out of nowhere, dude just looks over and he says, you know, like whatever. He's like, Hey, my wife and I are about to get a divorce. And you're like, what? Like, mm -hmm. and you don't even like, and that's when, you know, when you hear anything like that, that kind of breaks the getting beyond talking about facts or sports or the weather or a hobby, anytime that you get to that level, then, then that guy's showing you, Hey, I trust you enough to let you in to be my band of brothers. They may right. not be able to put words to it, understand it, mm -hmm. but I think most men have this. They just may not have a group that they are accountable to and, you know, and that they hold each other accountable to. But yet I think every man has that if he just listens. Right. Yeah. But it's just, it's just going to function differently. I don't think it has to be all that structured. Sometimes it needs to be structured. I mean, if there's like an intervention, I mean, I've had, I've had moments here, even locally where, you know, a guy will be doing something and, and it's a blind spot for him. And then I get together with a couple of guys and we're like, Hey, we need to go talk to him. And then usually it's one of us because, you know, you don't want to get in a group and all of a sudden you got three guys at you and you feel like you're, you know, you have to just turtle up, you know, they're yeah. all coming at me. But yet it usually has one of us becomes a spokesperson and actually says what it is that the others are seeing and they receive it well. Mm -hmm. but, but humility, back to humility, this is the important part. It's with that understanding. I can learn anything from anybody, mm -hmm. right? And ultimately yeah. it's, it's getting to the place of understanding that I cannot be the man that I want to be alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my it, job to look for a band of brothers, it's right. my job. It's not my dad's job. It's not my neighbor's job. It's not my coworker's job. It's not that guy I fish with. It's not his job. It's my job. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think if, if men, if we would turn the tide as men and come to the place where we would have freedom to say those words, I think there would be guys all around us and said, you know what? I'm glad you said that because I've wanted that for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And, and I think part of the, the, the whole aspect of, uh, to your point, it, it's not to sit around and talk about feelings, right. uh, which, which you're right, is often misinterpreted. But it's really to sit with your fellow man and, and learn to grow together, to mm -hmm. share experiences, uh, build a safe space of trust where you can be vulnerable and I think that's the biggest thing that's holding men back is they just don't know how to be vulnerable. And even vulnerability for a lot of men comes with conditions. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I need all these things before I can share something. And mm -hmm. it, it's so powerful where, when you can just sit down and you just open up and, you know, you could see the impact it has 
<clears throat> excuse me, when other men are sitting around and they all feed off of that. Yeah. I, I will say this in this, this probably isn't to all of your audience, but there's going to be somebody in your audience. This is going to speak into, this is a problem. This is something I did to myself. I tend to be the type of person who I tend to be the first one to say it sometime in, and even to the point of giving unsolicited advice, I can be that person. And I know that And several years ago, this was really brought to my attention. And the reason why I mentioned that is not, you know, shaming myself for talking about all that, but to leverage this point, sometimes, even if you're the one who's the most vocal, it's going to be a hard time finding someone for it. You may have a hard time finding a band of brothers because they think that they have to match where you are. It's our job, if we're the talker, if we're the one who's always carrying the room, if we're the one who people look to as an authority on something, it's our job as men to humble ourselves and to speak less and to listen more. And even though we may have something to interject, to be very, very relationally aware and emotionally aware to know, you know what, I just can't do this because if I say this right now, nobody's going to say anything else. And it's, it's our job, I think, is, is the ones, again, some people in your audience that we're the maybe the overshares and other mm -hmm. people think oh man if i've got to do that i i don't think i'll ever get to that point mm -hmm. and and some of that's just a base of a, of a personality so it's it's our job before the talker to throttle that back so other people can speak yeah up. yeah and i think uh you know what i try to the term i try to use in those instances is really being the facilitator Right. And, and not everyone sitting around has to be the facilitator mm -hmm. uh, or have to share as much information as you said. Um, I think the goal is to really create that safety um, and, and build that trust. And, and it often takes one or two people to, to carry that facilitation before others can feel comfortable themselves. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's one of the things it's, it and why I mentioned the uh, earlier, if if one guy shares, the other share. It's like a breach in a dam, right? Mm -hmm. Once that breach happens, guys are like, "Okay, I can do this." Like, and maybe it's it's just a little bit. I'll give you an example. So several years ago, um, I had a coworker by the name of Al, and I'd worked with him for a long time. I wouldn't necessarily consider him one of my band of brothers ever. Uh, he was a good guy. He he was considered he was about 10 years older than me. He was just becoming a dad. I was already a dad, I had two kids at this point. And so I'd work with Al for a better part of a year. And it, it was just a really cool thing. There was just one day where we we were working together. Um, I worked on airplanes and I was in the test cell and I went in and he just asked me a question. He was just honest about the relationship mm -hmm. with his son. And his son was really young, like toddler young. And he's like, I have no, I, he just asked me out of the blue. I, I didn't, I didn't give advice. I didn't do anything, but he just mm -hmm. saw the type of man that I was and the way that I could freely talk about my own life. He just said, he was like, man, he's like, I have no idea how to connect with my son. And it scares me to death that I'm going to lose him mm -hmm. for a man to admit that. I mean, that is a, that's a deep seated fear. And I mm -hmm. realized, wow, that's a powerful moment. Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, I didn't go through and be like, oh, well, Al, I'm, I'm really glad you said that. Let me give you five steps you can do. I'm like, yeah. oh, stupid. No guy wants that. Then all of a sudden you're a project, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants, no dude wants to be a project either. No. So what I did was I just listened. And over time, we revisited that. You know, when he mentioned that, I gave one, I gave one bit of advice. One. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I could have probably said 10 things, I, but I said one thing. Yeah. And, and that's all it was. And it was something for him to chew on. And then we revisited that a couple of times whenever he was ready. Yeah. And, and again, I'm not saying that I have it all figured out, but that's one example to where I had, I had done some self work and realized that I was an over talker. And because of that, I would just, I could shut down a room in two seconds. But when I shut my mouth and I opened my ears and all of a sudden I was, he, yeah. he had a, you know, he had a need <clears throat> and I was able to at least talk to him about how to meet that need for a son. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> I, I think uh, one of the things uh, I read today actually was how our natural tendency is just to fix it rather than listen, right? So I think for anyone, whether it's uh, men or women, when they are opening up, they just want to be heard. Uh, and, you know, like majority of the time, they're not looking for a solution. They're not looking to you to fix it. Um, it's really just sit there and listen. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's so important how powerful that is, because, you know, it's, 
it, it translates to talk therapy, right? When people go for therapy and they just want to talk, um, that's the whole purpose of it. Yeah, it's a matter of, to me, it's a matter of respect. One of the core needs of a man is respect. Mm -hmm. And when, when you or me or whoever will sit down and listen to another guy or just talk to another guy in whatever way we can in a non-condescending, non-therapeutic, non I'm the counselor guy, Yeah. but just, just listen to a guy. It shows him that you respect him. And going back to, you know, relationship with, uh, you know, in a committed relationship with a woman. It's the same thing. That's all he wants. He wants to be respected. Mm -hmm. He's going to fail. She's going to fail. He wants to be – his core need is he wants to be respected because a man – I love what John Eldridge says because the, the core in a man, he wants to be able to answer this question, do I have what it takes? Yep. Yeah. And when you respect me enough to listen to me, you help validate that belief that maybe I just do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's that's powerful. Um, Chad, I – just want to thank you again for coming on to the podcast and sharing everything you shared. Uh, again, really appreciate it. Uh, I guess for listeners that want to uh, get a hold of you, whether it's online or social media, what are some of the ways they can do that? Yeah. So if you want to tune into my podcast after you get done listening to a plethora of this <laughs> podcast, uh, you can go to the podcast that I host and that I founded the movement for men called new kind of man all those podcasts are out there i've interviewed a lot of uh, interesting people a lot of navy seals we've talked a lot about mindset we've talked a lot about just their story their walk through fatherhood just what it means to be a man we talked had a lot of great conversations uh, in regards to that also the podcast that i host now is called men of iron you can uh, lean into that some of these topics that we've even discussed tonight mm -hmm. are, are on there uh, i have solo cast and i also do some interviewing and if you just want to follow me on social media, you can find me at Facebook at New Kind of Man, and you can find me on Instagram at, at a New Kind of Man. And uh, if you give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out. <laughs> Thanks again, Chad. Uh, again, thank you so much for coming here and, and super grateful to have this conversation with you. Yeah, I thought it was great. Thanks for having me. Anytime. <laughs> we'll probably need to have more conversations. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. As always, please subscribe to the podcast if you enjoy the episodes or leave a comment in the comment section. I always love hearing from you. Thank you again and until next week.